Well, good morning. Let me add my thanks uh, to all of you for the work that you are engaged in through this effort. And uh, as I was thinking about you and about the work that you're uh, undertaking, uh, I once again uh, fell into a little trap that I occasionally fall into, which is to pay attention to fortune cookies when I have Chinese food. Anybody do that? Uh, you can follow them. Uh, uh, when I finish sharing this little quote, I'll give you the, the six numbers that will win the lotto for you uh, next week. But let, let me tell you uh, the one that, that popped out of my fortune cookie uh, one evening last week. It simply said, a solid challenge will bring forth your finest abilities. Well, we have a significant challenge uh, in the work that we're endeavoring to do uh, through this effort. And we spent last evening with all of our coaches, the ISD coaches and the college coaches, talking about kind of where we are. But as important as that, we also talked about the problems that we need to solve, and uh, we'll try and, and work hard to solve them. But my challenge to you today is about rising to the challenge of the issues that ought to be driving us as we uh, are working on something so important. And as we do that, uh, I hope that we'll keep our eyes straight ahead on the challenge that we face here in the Gulf Coast of Texas and on what the outcomes need to be over both the short term and the long term because there is so much at stake. Uh, I was thinking a lot about the Gulf Coast as I drove over here yesterday. Where, where is the Spring Branch group? Is there anybody in the group of Spring Branch? Okay, I, I was thinking a lot about Spring Branch uh, as I drove over from Austin yesterday. Uh, because that's where I took my first job uh, out of college back in the dark ages. Uh, my wife is not here, so I can tell you what it actually was. It was 1961. And uh, I, I remember vividly reaching the end of the summer in 1961 without a job. And uh, I, I said, where is there a terrific school system that needs me? And I got in the car and said, I'm not coming home until I have a job. And uh, I walked into the personnel office at, at Spring Branch in the summer of 1961, and the guy's name was Elmer Hinkle. Anybody remember Elmer Hinkle? Anybody ever know him? He was the HR director. And before I left Spring Branch that day, I had a job. And it was a terrific job. Uh, I had, uh, had grown up on the wrong side of the tracks in San Antonio, had lots of friends who, uh, by the time I was in college, had either gone to prison or were dead. Well, I understand what some of the struggles are that, that you deal with uh, day by day in your respective districts out there. And uh, I, I think back on the, the transitions that I made between the point where I finished high school, when no one ever talked to me about going to college, not one person ever talked to me about going to college. And the time that I made that trip to Spring Branch and got that first job that I'll uh, allude to here in just a moment. And just think about how our world has changed during that time. And think about what's at stake. And think about the urgency that I feel in all the work that, that I do. Uh, I was lucky to get to college. No one from my family had ever gone to college. My father finished the fourth grade and that was it. And uh, I got to college because I could shoot a basketball, which was fun. Uh, and I had the notion that, that somehow if I could uh, just end up being a coach, uh, that I could be a happy person for the rest of a lifetime. And the job that I got in Spring Branch was as a consultant. I, I didn't have any idea that there could be such jobs for uh, brand new college graduates, but I was a health and physical education consultant in Spring Branch. And my first assignment was to be involved in in-service training for teachers in the late summer of 1961. Fresh out of college, and here I was in front of a bunch of teachers. And my job called for me to, uh, to circulate among the elementary schools in Spring Branch. And uh, there was one other person who had the same job I did. His name was Jack Ragsdale. I don't know if any of you have ever uh, known him. And I mention him because I have a letter in my pocket that he uh, 
he wrote to me just the other day, and I'd lost it. Found it in my portfolio as I was digging through for my materials for this meeting today. So I have this letter from Jack Ragsdale, who did the same job I did, and we split all the elementary schools in Spring Branch, and we were in a different school every day, doing demonstration teaching and uh, getting to know the faculty. And uh, by the time I'd done that for a few months, uh, there were thousands of kids all over Spring Branch who knew me. So I couldn't go anywhere in the community without having somebody tugging on my shirt tail. And the teachers loved us uh, for a host of reasons. For some, it was just a matter of getting maybe a, a period free to not have to be on stage. And so they loved when we did demonstration teaching. Uh, but they saw the value of what we were doing. And uh, what I learned in that process was about the joy of learning. And to see that even at the third grade level, kids could give you feedback on whether or not what was happening to them in school was helpful or not. And that was a terrific insight that, uh, that I gained during those years. Just two years is all I spent there. But I learned about a couple of decades worth of uh, information about how to go about doing education, working with the great people in Spring Branch. So I, I was just thinking a lot about Spring Branch and all of that experience that I had. I lived in a garage apartment that was owned by the secretary of Joy Rowland. Some of you might, might, have, ever, might have known Joy Rowland. He was an assistant superintendent later became CEO of what is now Lone Star College, and a uh, terrific, terrific person. And uh, I thought that, uh, that that foundation I got back in 1961 through 1963 served me well. Uh, first ever to go to college out of my family, and I've uh, reflected on that as well. You're dealing with thousands and thousands and thousands of people for whom that is the reality. Never had the chance to go to college anybody in their family. And so as we come to talk about what we're doing in Gulf Coast Pass, I hope we'll be thinking about the folks like me who come from families that uh, never had a chance and think about what's at stake if they don't get that chance uh, as they move from your independent school districts into college, whether it's a community college in your local community or elsewhere. So I hope that by the time we're through with this little session this morning, we'll have a uh, heightened a sense of urgency, realizing what's at stake, that we'll have our eyes focused on the future, uh, knowing that those of us who are involved in Gulf Coast Pass are going to be working hard to solve whatever problems we still have with funding and other issues that are related to this. But the work we're trying to do here is critical. And it's the kind of work that we ought to be doing whether or not anybody gives us any extra money to do it. It ought to be what we get up and do without regard for uh, any extra funding that might come our way. And so that's the kind of urgency that I hope we'll have as we begin to talk about the, the topics of the morning. Now, the topic that you'll see there, community colleges and bachelor's degrees, might seem to be a little far afield, but I want to show you why I don't think it is. Let me start with this. I want you to realize what the reality is in Texas. And I apologize for that little uh, technical glitch there. What you see on the screen in front of you is a look at all bachelor's degrees awarded in the fiscal year 2010-2011. And I picked a number of states that are big community college states. And what you see there for fiscal year 2011 are the number of baccalaureates awarded in the states you see listed. And you can see that in Texas, there were 148,980 bachelor's degrees awarded. Of that number, 78% of those graduates came from community colleges prior to transferring to universities to pursue a baccalaureate degree. I want you to absorb that and compare it to the states listed below. California, Florida, Washington, North Carolina, New York, all high population states, all major community college states, but look at that descending percentage of students who get their start in a community college. The 78% is the highest percentage among the 50 states in these United States. And you can see what kind of margins there are compared to some other uh, large population states. You'll see the little footnote there, and I hope that's legible. If it's not, let me tell you what it says. Of those 
Only 24% of them had been enrolled for just one term prior to transfer. In other words, 76% of those transfer students had more than one term. And it went all the way up to as many as 10 terms in the community college prior to transfer and completion of the associate degree prior to transfer. But I think it's fair to say that even if a student spent only one full term as a full-time student in a community college, uh, that is a substantive involvement in and contribution to uh, the pathway being pursued by that community college transfer student. 78% of all baccalaureate degrees in fiscal 11 students transferred from community colleges before completing the baccalaureate. Now these are data coming from the National Student Clearinghouse involving over 3,000 colleges and universities around the country. And the national percentage is that 45% of all students who finished a four-year degree in 2010-11 had previously enrolled in a community college. So the average, 45%, Texas, 78%. And more than half of that 78%, I'm sorry, 45%, pardon me, more than half of them earned their bachelor's degrees within three years. That's productive, that's important. These are the first data we've seen of this type coming out of the National Student Clearinghouse. The Clearinghouse does a terrific service to the field because it allows us to look both at public universities and also private universities to see what's happening with transfer students and with the, the movement through these universities. Uh, clearly, as you look at the data, you'll see that most community college students who transfer to universities go to public universities. That's not to say there's not a, a good mix of, of students going to private colleges and universities, but the vast majority are transferring to public universities. Now, let's look further at Texas. Take a look at what's happened with higher ed enrollment in Texas since 2006, during that period 2006 to 2011. The growth in community college enrollment, as you can see, was over 30% during that time. And in the four-year sector, it was 15.8%. The community college growth uh, has slowed a little as we hit this stage, at the, as we look at the, uh, the current academic year, 2012-2013, uh, that growth trend has not been uh, on the same steep plane that it had been on prior to 2011. But nevertheless, I want you to see the impact of the community college enrollment growth in Texas. It is tilted toward the community college where I think it will remain for a very long time. And as you look at that transfer process in Texas universities, I wanted you to see that in fact, those completing the baccalaureate, 78% of them got their start in community colleges. You see where Texas ranks in bachelor's attainment, this comes out of the, community, the Coordinating Board Almanac. Number 28 out of 50. Anybody want to raise their hand and say that's satisfactory? We're happy to be ranked number 28 out of 50 in these United States at a time when the baccalaureate degree could never be more important than it is. Or the associate degree ever more important than it is. Folks, we are settling for too little. We need a sense of urgency as we think about what's at stake. And we need to think about how Texas is lagging the nation, and we need to think about how the nation is lagging the world as we come together and have the kind of conversations that we'll be holding here today. I want you, as you think about your community college neighbor, if you're from an independent school district, or if you're a community college person thinking about your independent school district neighbor, I want you to see the importance of the partnership that is building here uh, because of what's at stake. I've seen two or three reports in just the last 10 days, and I have a stack in my office that now is about three feet high, and I collect reports from all over the country. And I've seen at least three in the last few days that all draw the same conclusion. 
and it shouldn't be surprising to you, but if a, a person attains the baccalaureate degree, their family income or their, uh, their uh, annual income is considerably higher than anybody else to whom I will uh, allude here in a moment. Their unemployment rate is considerably lower than anybody else I will mention here in just a moment. Number two, associate degree holders don't make as much as bachelor's degree holders, but they make more than anybody else I'm going to mention here in just a moment. And their unemployment rate is lower than anybody else I'm going to mention here in just a moment. Next come those who have some college but no credential. Some college but no credential. They too earn more than those who come behind them. They too have a lower unemployment rate than those who come behind. And then it doesn't surprise you, I'm sure, to know that high school graduates do better than those who never graduate from high school. And they too have a lower unemployment rate than those who never graduated from high school. But that, that slope of that line, if you're looking at a graph, is clear. We keep saying it over and over. As I say, I've seen three reports in just the last couple of weeks making the very same points. So we know that as students attain more than anybody else in their family, as students attain more than they ever imagined that they could attain, as they attain credentials that have meaning in the marketplace, they are on a pathway that will serve them and their families well into the future. Let's not settle for being 28th in, in America relative to bachelor's degree attainment. All right, I've talked about now how in the community college world, transfers to universities produce 78% of all the baccalaureates in Texas in fiscal 2011. I just pulled four universities, uh, again from the coordinating board almanac, to look at the graduation rate for those community college transfers to those universities in a three-year period. And take a look. Sam Houston State at 63.2%, A&M at 793 University of Texas at Austin at 71.7%, University of Houston at 437 and so on. Now, in your part of Texas, in the Gulf Coast of Texas, all of you in this room have graduates of your independent school districts and graduates of your community colleges and transfers before graduation from your community colleges who are going to these universities. There are others to, to which they go, but these are four primary ones to which your students gravitate. University of Houston, during their work in achieving the dream, decided to go to work on that transfer from community colleges to U of H. And they, they're making progress. They're lagging Sam Houston State, clearly. We hope there will be a day not too far down the road where they will reach the same level as Sam Houston State. Uh, the highest being A&M and UT uh, are probably never gonna be reached by anybody else in the state, would be my guess. Part of that is a function of Blinn College, which is a community <coughs> college, opening a brand new campus several years ago, more than several now, uh, in College Station. And they have thousands of students who are in the community college because they're in the same community with A&M and that's where they intend to be. Same thing is true with Austin Community College and University of Texas at Austin and some of the other neighboring community colleges. But take a look at Sam Houston State. Uh, that's a significant percentage. They don't have a community college right there in town with them. There may be centers. I can't recall how that breaks out. Somebody in the room might know uh, what community college might have an extension center uh, in Huntsville. But uh, Sam Houston State obviously is, is making progress on this agenda of attracting community college transfers and getting them through uh, to the baccalaureate uh, in an expeditious way. Uh, that, that is a pathway that, that is awfully important to everybody in this room. As you think about the students that you serve, day by day and week by week in your respective independent school districts and in your community colleges. Now, will all of our students get a baccalaureate? Of course not. Should they all have the opportunity to pursue that pathway? I think the answer ought to be yes. 
we need to be thinking about how to open up that door and to let students move as far as they are capable of moving. Let's think more about what's happening right now in the Houston area and take a look at where Houston is relative to the baccalaureate. Take a look there at that first bullet. Middle of the pack, 28%, 28.4, holding a baccalaureate degree. <coughs> is the Houston Gulf Coast area content to be in the middle of the pack? I hope not. I hope not. There's a lot of pride in, in this part of Texas. And who can be happy with being in the middle of the pack? As we think about being in the middle of the pack, where are populations increasing dramatically as a percent of the total population? Well, Houston Independent School District gives us one look at that. Where's HISD in the room? Anybody back over here? Okay. 62% in 2010, Latino, 27% African American. The future of Texas, in reality, will go with how well we do, particularly with the Latino population in Texas. And unfortunately, as we look at that population, those students are disproportionately represented in the students who enter community colleges and universities needing remediation. Disproportionately represented. Now, I happen to believe, based on my 50 years of work, that it's more related to income than it is to race and ethnicity. I have little doubt in my mind about that. But we must realize that the future of this region, the future of our state, relates to closing all the gaps that exist right now between whites and Latinos and African Americans, and then raising all boats beyond that to higher and higher levels of attainment. 10 OECD nations outperformed the United States on high school completion. Are we content to be number 10 in the world? I could go on down that pathway. This comes out of a report done right here in your community, the Center for Houston's Future, and a uh, 2012 Community Indicator Report. Are we content to be 10th in the world on high school completion? Are we content to be in the Houston Gulf Coast area, kind of in the middle of the pack? Are we content to be in the middle on anything? Or are we going to be working on the kind of agenda that gives us the chance to move to the top of the pack? whether we're talking about high school completion, avoidance of the need for remediation, but if remediation is needed, are we gonna get them through that remedial section of their lives onto college readiness so that they have the chance to be on that path to a baccalaureate degree, and so that this region and this state and this nation won't be in the middle of the pack on baccalaureate completion or associate degree completion. I think that the sense of urgency that I feel ought to drive every one of you in this room as you think about the work you do every day. I just pulled a few uh, examples out of this look at, at Houston, the Community Indicator Report. And let's look, first of all, at just the third grade level and uh, think about where you are at your respective ISDs. Only 48% of our region students and only 38% of economically disadvantaged students are reading at commended levels in grade three. Less than half. In the case of economically disadvantaged students who are, who are disproportionately Latino and African American, down at 38%, reading at a commended level in grade three. And as I saw that uh, information, I thought back again on my days in Spring Branch as I really got to know thousands and thousands of third graders and first graders and sixth graders and saw the, the joy that they had in learning, saw what kind of enthusiasm they brought to the school campus every day and wondered what happened to them along the way. 
I left that experience and, and others in, in the next few years believing that anybody who was willing to teach eighth grade would be the most heroic human beings in America. <laughs> now I think that's probably shifted a little bit because students today are maturing a little earlier, so it might be seventh grade. Now, if you agree with me, raise your hand. I, I'd be interested in your reaction to that. What used to be eighth grade, I, I, any, anybody working in the seventh grade, I think is heroic. But what happens along the way? And how do we settle for what we see as we look at our data? In your area, 53% of the region's ninth graders successfully completed Algebra 1. 47% did not. How can we be satisfied with that? In the Houston region, just 71% of an entering ninth grade group will graduate from high school on time. And in Texas, we rank last in the nation in helping adults earn the high school diploma uh, when students dropped out and, and didn't get it at the point where they exited high school. Do we feel and see day by day that sense of urgency in the work we do is the question that I ask. And as I ask it, I want to set the stage for a little conversation that I think we have time for. And I'm going to transfer if I can here to how acceptable, question to the ISD folks, how acceptable is it to talk about the value of a high school graduate moving on to the, the community college in the neighborhood versus the kind of value that is placed on uh, being accepted into a highly selective university? Uh, and as I look back over all of my years, and I've always, wherever I've been, I was a community college president for almost 33 years. In every one of those places where I served in that role, I had partnerships with independent school districts like those of you in this room. And it was always about the process of trying to figure out how to help the community college alternative be higher on the list as counselors talk with kids and with parents about the options that were available to them. And so I want you to think about the extent to which people talk about the community college as a viable option for large numbers of kids exiting your school districts. And uh, you don't have to give me your opinion, but you can if you'd like to. But what do you hear? How acceptable is it among the kids in your school districts, among the parents of those kids, to think about the community college as an option right out of high school? Can I get some feedback from you? What, what do you hear around the coffee pot at the water cooler uh, as you circulate? What do you hear about the acceptability of the community college as an option for students graduating from your independent schools? Anybody willing to give me a reading? Uh, okay, let me, let me get a Houston person. Uh, I saw one here. I'll, I'll come back to you, George. Well, this is from the ISDs. Uh, one of the persistent problems that we have had is convincing some of our partners that our dual credit courses are just as good, if not better, than AP courses. We have a very large partner that awards a bonus point to students on their GPA if they take an AP course, but not if they take a dual credit course. So obviously, dual credit is not as good in their eyes. And yet, when we've shown them the graduation rates of students who took dual credit, it uh, hasn't seemed to change that perception, and I, I don't understand that. Okay. that. That's from a community college person looking back at the ISD. Do I have an ISD person with them tell me what you hear? Let me come back there. I'm from Pasadena, and um, this is from the standpoint of students of a senior counselor. And I know when I ask students where they're going to go when they finish, they kind of um, shy away when they're going to say community college. Because when a kid says, I'm going to go to a &M, everybody's like, woo, yay! Well, I try to emphasize that when they say they're going to go to a community college, I do the same thing. Because it's always been a big 
production of Babylon and A&M and UT and all of those, but everybody can't do that. So uh, because of that, I think the kids shy away from it because nobody really puts up a big deal about it because, you know, it's like, oh, I'm, I'm going to go to the community school, you know, that type of thing. Thank you so much for sharing that. How many of you knew before this morning that 78% of all bachelor's degrees in Texas in 2011 were awarded to students who started in community colleges? How many of you knew that before this morning? Anybody? Go home and talk about that. That's a fact. And if you can find a way to celebrate those kids in their transition to the local community college in the same way you celebrate a student going wherever, you will make a huge difference in the lives of thousands and thousands and thousands of students. Who else would give me a reading on what you hear around the water cooler at the coffee pot? I'm in Spring Branch, and our new initiative is T24. Um, I think it largely depends on the school where you're talking. Um, in some areas, we, we celebrate any going on to any, whether it's technical, but in some of the schools, certainly university is what they want to accomplish. And others, we really, you know, we're happy to get them through and, and out on to further education, whatever that may be. As we were preparing for the Gulf Coast Pass, I did a little study on the Houston area and followed one high school graduating class from one of the best high schools in the region in the view of most people I talked to. One of the best high schools in the region and found that the full 25% of the graduates of that high school who went to a university in Texas had less than a 2.0 GPA at the end of the first year in that university. Graduates of the best high school in the area, a full fourth of them ended up with less than a 2.0 GPA. Now, what do you think happens to those best students who don't get a 2.0? Where are they going to be the following year? They're in your neighborhood community college. That's exactly where they are. All right, who else would give me a reading on what you hear? Oh, George, you had a comment. No, no, I'd rather hear from you. Okay. Thank you. Another hand? Yes, thank you. Good morning, I'm from Spring Independent School District. Uh, we have the majority of our students go to the community college, uh, either for a two-year degree or before they go on to the four-year university. And I really attribute that to a college connections program that we have with Lone Star College North Harris. Uh, the students feel very comfortable with that transition. They can enroll uh, to go on to Lone Star College while they're still in high school. They can get advisement while they're still in high school. And so our numbers are very high for our students that start at community college. Thank you for sharing that. I'm delighted to hear that. Who else would give me a reading on what you hear? How acceptable is it? Okay, let me hustle over here. Appreciate the candor here. Well, this is one of our coaches who has an observation. Yeah, and, and uh, I, I'm Alice Phillips, and I'm a coach for uh, Lee and his credit. And this is a memory of an observation. Uh, I worked in North Alabama at a community college, and one of our theater schools, uh, Athens College, uh, High School, it's an excellent high school. And I was there one day um, um, making uh, connections and had in the room with me about 80 seniors. I knew uh, from our numbers that about 50% of all Athens high school graduates came to Calhoun College, my college. And I went in all full of bubble and said, I'm so glad you're here. Let me tell you about what we have offer, um, offered for the coming fall for you. How many of you plan to go to Calhoun this fall? Three hands went up in the room. And obviously, I think we still have that same issue of perception um, and how we can build perception that going to the community college, which probably in their heart of hearts these kids knew, 
The Sunniite was not okay for them to admit that to their peers and to their high school counselors and teachers, probably. I certainly had all of my years of reflection kind of drawing the same kind of conclusion. They, they can't stand up and say that's where I'm going, but next year that's where they are. Comment? Well, you want the uh, pulse of the community and students? Okay, not, not my view. Um, the community college has an image problem. We need to change the name. Perhaps like the Florida model, like Houston College, like Lone Star did it already. Because when you say community college, it's an image with the young people, because they have told me, even though in the, you know, their closet community college attendees, they'll say that they don't like the community. And then there was another, the Pulse of America, there was a, a show called Community College on TV. I, I watched it once, and you know that? So I'm just saying, uh, it's quality, I believe in it. My own daughter came to the Houston Community College, so I trust the faculty. Uh, but the image, you know, like celebration, like what she was referring to, perhaps we should consider just saying college, because words matter and images matter. Um, that's just the pulse. Okay, yes, let me uh, get you a microphone. I'm Donna Summers, I'm also from Pasadena ISD, but, but I want to talk about the family concept of it because I'm also a mother of a Deer Park Independent School District student. And while I'm a University of Houston Cougar, and I have to say that because we're here, both my husband and my mother went to San Jacinto uh, College in Pasadena. And I will say, Image has a lot to do with it because they are growing and expanding and building, and you cannot drive down the road without noticing San Jacinto College anymore. You just can't do it. So my son doesn't know the difference between University of Houston, University of Texas, and San Jacinto because to him they're all just big universities and they all play basketball. So I think Image does have a lot to do with it uh, for families and kids as well as educators. Okay, one more comment. Someone would be willing to share. What, what do you hear? What, what's the reality in your community relative to the acceptability? of where one goes after high school. Anybody else willing to share a reflection? Yes, thank you. I'm from San Jacinto College. Um, I could say that when advising students at times, they'll come in and they really don't want to get the degree because they want to get the degree from the four-year institution. Um, but on my wall, I have my um, Eastern Community College degree and my bachelor's degree and my master's degree. And I said, look at my bachelor's degree. Where on here do you see that I went to a community college? I said, this is what you're going to display. This is what you're going to be proud of. And when people walk across that stage, they're not going to know the difference. So it is a misconception that some of the students have. Way back in the dark ages, when I transferred from my local community college, which happened to be San Antonio College in San Antonio, Texas, when I transferred to the University of Texas at Austin, my grade point average went up. Went up. We have got to get to a point where we celebrate achievement at each step along the way as we think about the students we're in business to serve. And part of that may have to do with what we decide to celebrate. Uh, I have uh, grandkids and it's been fun watching them as they reached the end of their high school experience and got ready to think about college. So I've seen what it's like through their eyes. I've had three of them now go through that process. So I've been uh, really very active in, in their lives thinking about those transitions. And three of them are now in college, one about to graduate. But watching them and their peers at that point where they're finishing the high school experience, thinking about what's next, Thinking about what gets celebrated, what gets forgotten, or maybe ignored because somehow we don't uh, quite elevate it to the, the level of celebration. It's kind of shocking to me. And so I encourage you, if you think about the conversations you'll have today, and the conversations you'll have back home, to be thinking about the value of each human being who comes into your respective settings 
independent school districts or colleges, whichever the case may be. Think about what's at stake. Think about whether or not you're satisfied to be in the middle of the pack. Is that okay? Is that okay for you, your family, your kids, your neighbors, those with whom you work every day? Is that okay to be in the middle of the pack? Or is there the chance that in the Gulf Coast of Texas, because of people like you, we begin to elevate the conversation in a way that begins to make a difference in the lives of kids every day? I encourage you to think about even for the, the end of this spring and the graduating class in your respective ISDs, think about how you're going to celebrate college-going behavior beyond the places where my grandkids have gone. I have a granddaughter who's graduated from Dartmouth this spring, and I'm as proud of her as I can be. I have another granddaughter who just started at Duke. Proud of her. Wonderful. Uh, that in my family, we can go from a father, in my case, who only got through the fourth grade, to the point where there's no question about where my granddaughters were going to go and how well they would do when they got there. But that's no more important than what happens to every young person in each of your high schools as they think about what's next in their lives. So I challenge you to think about how to celebrate those transitions between your ISDs and your neighbor community college. Just as you would celebrate my granddaughter graduating from Woodlands High School and going to Dartmouth. All are important to our future. And I hope that as uh, I wrap up here, you'll think about the sense of urgency that needs to go with that. So with that, I'll stop. Thank you for sharing the thoughts that you shared. And uh, I think maybe I'm handing the microphone to Jim. So thank you for being so attentive.